Hi guys, so glad you could join us tonight for our Good Friday night service. Uh, we're excited about this. I actually will have a guest speaker. I'll share that in a second. But um, what has happened, the whole reason why I really want to do this tonight is we had a Seder dinner presentation scheduled for our church uh, by the Jews for Jesus folks. And because of all this virus stuff, they had to cancel. So the cool thing is we actually have got us rescheduled for next year, which is, write it down on your calendar, Tuesday, March the 30th at 7 p.m. next year, 2021, March the 30th, 7 p.m. That's a Tuesday, and that's only five days before Easter because Easter is early next year. So uh, <clears throat> what I want to do tonight before I, I, we show you this presentation of, of this neat Passover, I, I want to walk with you through the, just real quick, by the way, through the, uh, the, the last Passover. We know it as the Last Supper. The funny thing for me is Jesus had been through several Passovers, even with his disciples. He had three years of ministry, and they were with him at that time. So he'd been through at least two of them. And, and this was the last one, and, and it kind of shifted. And I'm not sure the disciples really got it, but I just want to walk you through the Scripture, and then we'll go on. So I'm, I'm going out of Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 7. It says, uh, Now the festival of unleavened bread arrived when the Passover lamb is sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John ahead and said, Go and prepare the Passover meal so we can eat together. Uh, well, where do you want us to prepare it, they asked him. So he replied, As soon as you enter Jerusalem, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you, so follow him. And at the house he enters, say to the owner, The teacher asks, Where's the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? Verse 12 says, and he will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That's how God is. God prepares everything before us, even in this virus that is kicking our country right now. So he says, <clears throat> he'll take you upstairs to a large room uh, that is already set up, and that's where you should prepare our meal. Verse 13, so they went off to the city and found everything just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal. And when the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table, and Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. Verse 16, for I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. I think the guys might have understood that a little bit, but I don't think they understood that as well as we do now because we, we know that the meaning of the Passover has been fulfilled. Verse 17 <clears throat> We use this a lot when we do communion. It says, Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. Again, I don't know how much they really understood, but Jesus had a real understanding that this was his the, the last Passover that he was going to, he was going to do. Verse 19, he, he took some bread and he gave thanks to God at it. Excuse me. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces. You remember that. He broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, This is my body, which is given for you. That is so powerful if we'll take the time to think it through instead of trying to run through Scripture. This is my body, and it was given for you. You go in Isaiah, and it says, By his stripes we are healed. And, and there's... Everything that Christ did and accomplished on the cross really is cool because he accomplished it for us, not for himself. Just really good. And then he said, as we all know, do this in remembrance of me. So after supper, verse 20, he, after supper, he took another cup. A lot of us don't realize this. He took another cup. And when you see this presentation tonight that we'll show you, you're going to see the significance of this second cup. And after supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. Now, that doesn't seem powerful to us, but I want you to know this had to shake these guys to the foundation. The only covenant they had known was the law covenant. And now Jesus is proclaiming this cup represents the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement that is confirmed by my blood which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. I've said it a lot, but again, I don't know how much they understood that. We understand it now because we're kind of after the fact. So uh, what I want to share with you 
is is it's a 35 minute video. It's a powerful, beautiful video of a Seder dinner, which is the Passover time. It's what the Jewish community now does, and I want you to watch it closely. Uh, the reason I say it's powerful huh, is because it it Jesus is incorporated in every part of the Passover. So here we are on Good Friday night, waiting for Sunday to come, and Sunday will be here, but tonight is Good Friday, and this is the night where Jesus shared in his last Passover. So watch this guest speaker that I have, and I'll talk to you for a second at the conclusion of it. It's only 35 minutes. Enjoy. Shalom. This is the first time I believe you've had Jews for Jesus. And some of you may be thinking to yourself, Jews for Jesus? What a strange name for a group of people. It sounds like a contradiction, like vegetarians for meat or something. Who ever heard of Jews for Jesus? Well, if you think about it, Jesus himself was Jewish, right? And the disciples, Peter and John and James, they were all Jews. All the writers of the New Testament, with the possible exception of Luke, were Jewish. See, back in the beginning, believing in Jesus was a very Jewish thing to do. As a matter of fact, when the first Gentile wanted to believe in him, oy vey, did we have problems. Never before had a Gentile wanted to believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob without first becoming a proselyte or a convert to Judaism. And so in the book of Acts, when Cornelius wanted to believe in our Jewish Messiah, this was something completely different. And you might remember that God had to give the Apostle Peter three visions before he finally got up enough chutzpah, enough nerve to go to the house of Cornelius where he preached the gospel and the whole family got saved, which was great. But then remember Peter had another problem on his hands. He had to go back to his fellow apostles in Jerusalem and explain to them what he had done. And there was such an uproar over this thing, we actually had to hold the first church council which you can read about in Acts chapter 15. And, and that first church council was held to resolve this burning question. What to do with the Gentiles for Jesus? And thankfully God told us it was okay. It was a good thing for Gentiles to be for Jesus. And we got so excited about that good news that we sent you some of our best missionaries. Paul and Silas and Barnabas. And well, I think they did a pretty terrific job, don't you? Because after a while, there were a lot more Gentiles for Jesus than Jews for Jesus. But that was okay, because we found out it was all part of God's plan from the beginning to break down that middle wall of partition that was dividing Jews from Gentiles, making us one together in the body of Christ. So we are one now in Him. And because of that, you share with me in a rich heritage, the heritage of the people of Israel and all that God did to reveal himself through the fathers and, and through the prophets and through the festivals of Israel. This now is your heritage too and the Messiah. Today we're going to look at one aspect of that beautiful heritage in the story of the Passover. Passover is the recounting of God's deliverance of the Jewish people from bondage and slavery in Egypt thousands of years ago. But as we look more closely at this Feast of Redemption, you're going to see that God, in delivering Israel from bondage in Egypt, wove into the very fabric of that story a picture of a far greater redemption of all the world from the Egypt of sin through our Passover Lamb, who is Jesus the Messiah. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, His last word was, It is finished. And of course, he wasn't merely speaking about 30 to 33 years of life and ministry. He was talking about the whole plan of God's redemption. It is finished. And Passover shows us the wonderful intricacy and the beautiful nature of that far-reaching plan that Jesus finished when he died on the cross and rose again. So travel back in time with me to that first Passover story which we find recorded in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 12, we'll be reading verses 5 through 8 and 11 through 15. Now, if you remember, at this time, Israel was in bondage. We were in slavery in Egypt, and God promised he was going to redeem us. And so he raised up Moses and sent him to Pharaoh to say, Pharaoh, let my people go. 
Now, Pharaoh wasn't exactly willing to listen, and so God had to persuade Pharaoh, and God can be very persuasive when he wants to be, and he persuaded Pharaoh, you'll remember, by sending a series of plagues on the land of Egypt, ten plagues in all. Now, the Jewish people were living in a section of Egypt called Goshen, and they were automatically exempt from the first nine of those ten plagues. For example, the Bible tells us when darkness fell across the land as a plague from the Lord, there was nevertheless light in Goshen where the Israelites were dwelling. Or when God struck the cattle of the Egyptians with a plague, the cattle of the Israelites was spared. But not so with the tenth plague, the worst plague, the death of the firstborn. In order that that plague should not also fall on the Jewish people, God commanded them to take a lamb, one for each family, And that's where we pick up the story now. Exodus 12, beginning with verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They they shall eat the flesh that night roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Now verse 11. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be for you for a sign on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, as a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. So that is the historical institution of the Passover. We know then that the first Passover was celebrated on the night of the 10th plague way back in the land of Egypt. But as we also just read, God commanded Israel to continue to celebrate Passover as a lasting ordinance, a permanent statute. And so throughout our history, as we continue to celebrate, there were various symbols and traditions added to the observance to remind us of this Passover, the first Passover in the land of Egypt. And so by the time that Jesus and his disciples were celebrating Passover, all but two of the items that you see on this table were already incorporated into the observance of Passover. Now, of course, the most significant Passover that Jesus and his disciples observed was that one in the upper room in Jerusalem. The Last Supper was a Passover. So then how much more significant does this festival come to be for us who are followers of Jesus in light of all that he said and did on that night he was betrayed? And of course, we're still celebrating Passover every year in Jewish homes all around the world. Passover usually occurs in the springtime. And there's a tremendous amount of preparation that goes into the celebration of Passover. Uh, You might even remember from the Gospel accounts that Jesus sent Peter and John ahead of him into the city of Jerusalem saying, Go and prepare the Passover that we may eat. Now, this preparation involves many different things, but most significantly doing exactly what we just read about in Exodus 12, verse 15, that the children of Israel had to do back in Egypt. We were to cleanse our houses of all leaven anything with yeast in it. So, of course, today that means that all your Dunkin' Donuts, all your bagels, anything with yeast in it has to go. But because Passover occurs in the springtime, in the traditional or orthodox Jewish home, this has become now a time for a general house cleaning. And mom will begin weeks in advance. Everything from floor to ceiling is clean. There's even a whole different set of dishes put out for use at Passover. But we have a problem. 
And the problem is that although it is the mother who does the cleaning of the house in the Orthodox Jewish home, the rabbis tell us only the father can certify that the house has been properly cleaned. You can see what kind of a problem we have. The rabbis knew that the men would be hard pressed to get the job done right by themselves and they certainly wanted to ensure peace and harmony in the home at Passover. So they got together and they thought about this problem and they thought about it and they came up with a solution which in Hebrew we call bedikat chametz or the searching out of the leaven. Here's how it works. The night before Passover, mom, already having cleaned the house of all leaven, will take a little bit that's left over, maybe crumbs from the toast they had for breakfast that morning, something with yeast in it, and she will take that and hide it somewhere in the house. Now, the father coming home that evening will take in his hand a feather, a wooden spoon, and a napkin, and he'll go on a GI inspection to search out the leaven, looking high and looking low for those crumbs. Now, if his wife has been good enough to him, she's hit it in the same place she hit it last year and the year before that and the year before that, so that when he finally finds those crumbs, he takes the feather and with a steady hand, he scrapes them into the spoon. This is what I call heavy house cleaning. Then he wraps the whole thing up in the napkin and in religious Jewish communities like in Brooklyn, New York or Jerusalem, Israel, you can still see that evening men marching off to the local synagogue where there's a bonfire burning in the courtyard. He takes the package, tosses it into the bonfire, recites a prayer and so declares the house now properly cleaned. <laughs> it's an ingenious way for the men to get out of the house cleaning, right ladies? But of course, you know, the Apostle Paul actually makes a very specific analogy to this custom of bedikat chametz in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 6. Paul says, your glorying is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so we see from that passage, Paul makes several points. First of all, leaven in the scriptures is often a symbol for sin. For just as a piece of leavened dough can be added to a lump of unleavened and that new lump is permeated with leaven and rises, so sin in our lives causes us to become utterly sinful and if you will, to become puffed up in our own estimation before God. And Paul points out that just as leaven is a symbol for sin, so then this unleavened bread, the matzah which we eat at the Passover for seven days, this then is a symbol of purity and of righteousness before God. Now ladies, I know you must be thinking it's not quite fair that you are the ones that have to do all the hard work cleaning house while the man gets all the ceremonial glory declaring it clean. Well ladies, you have your very own bit of ceremonial glory which actually ushers in the celebration of the Passover. And at this time, mom will take this book which is called Haggadah. Haggadah is a Hebrew word that means the story or the telling. And within this beautifully bound and beautifully illustrated book is the entire ceremony, the story, and all the prayers associated with the observance of the Passover. So mom takes this book and reads a prayer from it as she begins the service with the brachot haner, the lighting of the festival candles. And I'm going to sing that blessing in Hebrew. Now, I don't have a Haggadah for each and every one of you here today, but I have given each of you a brochure when you came in, and if you didn't get one, please raise your hand, and Usher will make sure you do. Inside this brochure are a number of the prayers that we recite, including this brachut haner. And so as I sing it in Hebrew, ladies, will you then join me in saying the English translation? Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher kitshanu b'mitzvotav v'tzivanu lahad likner shel yom tov. Amen. Ladies together in English. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, 
who sanctifies us by his commandments and commands us to kindle the festival lights. Now I think it is appropriate that it is the woman rather than the man who lights the candles and so brings light to the festival table because in the same way it was not through a man but through a woman and the will of God that the light of the world came into the world. As the prophet Isaiah declared, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of my people Israel. And at this time, our Passover celebration can begin. Now, Passover is observed primarily in the home around the family dinner table. And as you can see, at our table here, we also have pillows on the chairs which are a symbol to us of our freedom. As we read in Exodus chapter 12, the first Passover was eaten standing up. We had to have our loins girded, our shoes on our feet, our staves in our hands, ready to take off at a moment's notice. And you see, in ancient Near Eastern culture, only free people could recline at the meal. Slaves had to stand, and once we were slaves, but now we have been set free. And so that pillow on each chair is a symbol of our freedom. One other fact is that sometimes it can take anywhere from four to six hours to celebrate the Passover, so having a pillow is not a bad idea. But you know what, don't worry, we're gonna get through it quite a bit quicker today. Now, Passover as we celebrate it is a whole family time, so moms are involved, fathers, I'm leading the Passover, so I have the ceremonial garb that a father would wear, which is first of all this kittle, and that is the same garment worn by the priests as they would minister in the temple on behalf of the nation because, of course, dad is priest of his family. And then there's the mitre, which symbolizes a crown from the ancient Near East because, of course, dad is also king of his castle. And you thought I was going to be a contestant on Top Chef. Huh? Well, of course, this is only in traditional Jewish homes that this garb is worn. But Passover is not just a time for mothers and for fathers, it's especially a time for the children. And the children are invited to participate in a number of different ways, but most significantly through the chanting of the Ma Nishtana, four questions which are asked, the answer to which provides the basis for the retelling of the story of Passover known as the Magid. And so I'm going to recite that first question in Hebrew and then I want, I want to invite you to recite it with me in English. Ma nishtana halayla hazeh mikol halilod shebchol halilod onu ochlin chametz umatzah halayla hazeh kulo matzah which means why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights we eat leavened or unleavened bread. Why on this night do we eat only unleavened bread? And after chanting all four questions, the father then responds with the story and so fulfills the commandment of the scriptures to tell this from generation to generation that our children might know and understand that we were all brought together out of the land of Egypt. And just as there are four questions which unpack the meaning of the Passover, so you can see here in front of you there are four cups which really serve as the outline for the Passover service itself. Now each of us as we sit at the table has one cup, but you see we drink from that cup four different times and each time we drink there's a different name and symbolism given to the cup. And the first time we drink, it is called Kiddush, which literally means sanctification, because with this cup we sanctify all that is to follow. And there is a traditional Hebrew prayer that we say over this cup. Certainly Jesus himself said that prayer. And then our Lord said something directly related to that Hebrew prayer. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Borei pori hagafen Amen. Together in English. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates fruit from the vine. And then Jesus said, It is with great desire that I have desired to eat this Passover with you. But I tell you truly, I will not partake of the fruit of the vine again until I drink it anew in the kingdom. And with those words, Jesus was signaling to his disciples then and now 
that this is unlike any other Passover that has been observed because this Passover was to be fulfilled in the kingdom. Everything is blessed and sanctified and everything has a particular order to it as well. Now, Seder is the Hebrew word for order. Passover is referred to as a Seder meal and this is called a Seder plate. And despite its appearance, it's not for deviled eggs. You notice the six compartments on the Seder plate, they correspond to the various food items down through here, and a little bit of each of the food items is placed in the compartments on the Seder plate. And the first that we have is called carpus, which is the Hebrew word for greens, in this case, parsley. Now, the rabbis tell us that the greens represent life. And we will take some salt water, which represents the tears of life, and we dip the greens into the salt water, and so we are reminded that during our slavery in Egypt, our lives were immersed in tears. A life without redemption is a life immersed in tears. But we also remember that God redeemed us with a mighty and outstretched arm. He brought us out of bondage through that salty Red Sea and into freedom, and so now, by His mercy and grace, we can partake of life redeemed from tears, by the mercy and grace of Almighty God. The second item on the Seder plate, uh, horseradish. (laughs) We call it Jewish Dristan, and it's guaranteed to unclog the sinus passages in the back of your head. Now this stuff, maror, as it's called in Hebrew, is the very same bitter herb we read about in Exodus 12 that the children of Israel were told to eat back during our slavery. It reminds us of the bitterness of that slavery. Now, what we do is we take some of the unleavened bread, the matzah, which we're eating for seven days, and we break off a piece of it and say the blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Amen. Together in English. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Then we take the matzah and we dip it into the horseradish and get, oh, about a teaspoon of it on there like this. And then, I'm not going to do it. (laughs) You know what happens when you eat this much horseradish? You begin to cry. You have very little choice in the matter. It's a battle between the horseradish and your sinuses, and the horseradish always wins. But of course, the tears that we are shedding are a graphic reminder of the tears our forefathers shed during their slavery in Egypt. Now, you might remember when Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples, he had said to them, one of you is going to betray me. And the disciples got all upset. They said, Lord, is it I? Is it I? And Jesus said, he who dips in the sop with me this night, that one will betray me. Well, this is the sop that Jesus was referring to. And if you think about it, which one of the disciples didn't also dip with Jesus that night? Which one of them didn't also betray him? Even Peter, who said, oh, Lord, I will never betray you, three times denied the Lord. But then, of course, later on in the celebration, we find Jesus himself taking the bread, dipping it in the sop, and handing it to Judas Iscariot, saying to him, what you must do, go and do quickly. And the Bible tells us that when Judas took the bread with the sop, Satan entered into him, and he went out into the night. Maror is bitterness and tears. The next item on the Seder plate is called Cha Ro Seth. Can you all say that? Cha Ro Seth. Not bad, but you do have to get the ch in there. <laughs> yeah, just don't look at your neighbor when you say it, all right? Now, Cha Ro Seth is a sweet mixture of chopped apples and nuts, honey, raisins, and cinnamon. It's delicious, but it represents the mortar that we use to make bricks for Pharaoh during our slavery in Egypt. It, it kind of looks like mortar. And so you might ask the rabbi, well, now, wait a minute, rabbi. If Cheroseth represents mortar for bricks, which was bitterness and, and toil to our people, why is this so sweet? Ah, the rabbi will say, because you see, even the bitterest of our toils grew sweet 
when we knew that our redemption drew near. And what we do is take the matzah once again and dip it into the haroseth, this time maybe getting a double portion of it on there. And as we eat this mixture, you know that bitter taste left in our mouths from the horseradish? It just disappears in the sweetness of the haroseth which is a very tactile reminder that even the bitterest things that we all have to face in this life can be sweetened by the hope and promise of God's redemption. This is Hazaret. Hazaret is a bitter root, a horseradish root, or if you don't have one of those, an onion will suffice because this is just a symbol that rests on the plate to remind us of what the children of Israel certainly understood, and that is that the root of life itself is bitter. At the very core, there is a bitterness that we all experience in life, and this as a reminder of that root. But the last two items on the Seder plate are actually the only two that were not present when Jesus celebrated Passover in the upper room. And you'll understand why in just a minute. This is Hagiga. As you can see, Hagiga is an egg that has been hard-boiled, but it was also the name given to the festival sacrifice made in the temple at Passover. So this egg then represents that sacrifice. We peel the egg, we slice it, and before we eat the slice, we dip it into the salt water, which represents tears. And that symbolizes the fact that we are mourning over the fact that this is a memorial to a sacrifice that can no longer occur. A sacrifice which took place every year in the temple, but could only occur in the temple. Do you remember what Jesus said one day when he stood before that temple? He said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And of course he was speaking about his own death, burial, and resurrection, but he was also predicting what would happen to that temple after his death, burial, and resurrection. Its destruction and the fulfillment of that prediction occurred within a generation. In 70 AD, Titus and his Roman legions marched into the city, destroyed it, destroyed the temple, and from that day until this very present, there has been no temple, so there can be no sacrifice. And so Jewish people mourn that absence. And in fact, because of that, many of the rabbis say we should no longer eat lamb. One of the three main elements, the unleavened bread, the bitter herb, and the lamb, this lamb is now absent from most Jewish Passovers. And this last item, the zroah, the shank bone of the lamb, rests on the Seder plate as a continual reminder of the absence of that which was so important. We read about them in Exodus chapter 12. Those lambs were to be yearling male lambs without spot, without blemish, without any broken bone. We were to take that lamb and sacrifice it. And this reminds me of another perfect Passover lamb who, contrary to Roman custom, did not have his legs broken when he hung on the cross. And so did Jesus fulfill that type and that messianic prophecy not a bone would be broken. We come now to the second cup, which is called the cup of plagues. And, and we don't drink from this cup right away, but rather what we do is we put our finger in the cup and drop a drop on the plate in front of us, one for each of the plagues God visited on the land of Egypt. A full cup is a symbol of fullness of joy, so we want to symbolically lessen our joy as we remember those plagues. The blood, hail, locusts, boils, cattle disease, darkness, slaying of the firstborn. Nine times Pharaoh hardened his heart, and each time God sent a plague upon the land of Egypt. But the tenth plague was the worst of all. It was the death of the firstborn. Now God told the children of Israel to take the blood of that sacrificed lamb in a basin, to go outside of their homes and apply it to the doorposts, putting it on the top lintel and the two side posts. The blood of the lamb on the top lintel and the two side posts, making the sign of a cross with the blood of the lamb on that doorpost. That night death flew through the land of Egypt. There was weeping and wailing as never before till Pharaoh cried out, let them go, let them go or I'll die. 
but everywhere that the blood of the lamb was on the top lintel and the two side posts, death passed over that house. And so redemption came that night to the children of Israel in the land of Egypt. Now, because I believe in Jesus as my Messiah, and because I have by faith applied the blood of his sacrifice to the doorpost of my heart, when death comes to visit me, death is going to pass over me also because I have eternal life. Oh, praise God for that. This is called a matzotash. A matzotash, you already know matzah is the unleavened bread. Tosh just means bag or pouch, and that's what this is. It's a bag actually for three pieces of unleavened bread, and each piece is in its own section or compartment of the matzotash. And the rabbis tell us that this matzotash represents a unity. Three pieces of bread, one bag, three in one. And yet, there's a great deal of disagreement among the rabbis as to which unity it is this matzotash represents. Writing in the Haggadah, one rabbi tells us it represents the unity of the patriarchs. You know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Another rabbi says, no, it represents the unity of worship in Israel, the high priest, the Levites, and the people. And so on go several more explanations. Well, I believe the matzotash represents a unity also, but I believe that the matzotash represents the unity of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And here's why. During a particular time of the Passover, we will reach into the second or middle compartment of the matzotash. Now you can ask the rabbi, Rabbi, why do we take the second piece and leave the first and the third pieces hidden? And the answer is, we don't know. It's tradition. And so we take out this second piece of unleavened bread, calling it the bread of affliction. And there are three things I want you to notice about this bread. First of all, this is a whole loaf of bread, but look at it. It's flat, like a cracker. And that's because there's no yeast in it. It's completely unleavened. In fact, we're so concerned that there be no rising in the bread that when we make this, we use a special device to poke holes in the bread. You may be able to see the flame of the candle through the bread because it is not only unleavened, it is also pierced. And then we bake it at a high temperature on a rack and these brown stripes are baked onto the matzah, unleavened, striped, and pierced. Even as our sinless Messiah was striped by the Roman whips, pierced by the nails in his hands and feet and the spear in his side, as predicted some 700 years before Jesus came through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was pierced for our diseases, and by his stripes we are healed. We take this second piece from the middle compartment of the matzotash and we break it. Taking this broken piece, we now wrap it in a linen cloth or in a linen bag, calling it the afikomen. Afikomen is a word meaning he who is to come. This broken piece, now wrapped in a linen cloth, is carried outside of the room of celebration to be hid for a time, buried, if you will. And this is such an important part of the Passover, the entire celebration cannot be completed without that second piece. This last part of the celebration is the most important for we as followers of Jesus to understand. Towards the end of the meal, the head of the house will say to all the children, go search for the afikomen. Remember, that's that second piece that was broken and wrapped in a linen cloth and hid for a time. And this is a great time of fun for the kids because they didn't see where it was hidden. And so after a big meal, of course, what do they want to do? Get up and run around. And that's what they get to do now. Run around and, and look for that second piece, the afikomen, because the child who finds it brings it back to the head of the house and receives a reward. And then he stands and begins to break, take out the pieces of the afikomen and continue this ancient ceremony, breaking off small pieces which he hands to each one seated at the table. Everyone now receives a piece of this bread. Does this remind you of anything? You see, brothers and sisters, if the matzotash represents the unity of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, why is that middle piece broken, buried, and brought back? 
Or if the Matzatash represents the unity of worship, the high priest, the Levites, and the people of Israel, why is that middle piece broken, buried, and brought back? But if the Matzatash represents the unity of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then we know why. It's because Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, was broken in death, wrapped in a linen cloth, buried in the tomb, and then brought back, resurrected by the power of God, conquering sin, conquering death, so that it is no wonder that Jesus took this bread and broke it and gave to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Oh, hallelujah. What a picture that God has woven. Do you see it? Praise the Lord. And then he took the cup. Well, now you know, we take the cup four different times during Passover, so which time was this? Well, thankfully, the Lord, the scriptures tell us, took the cup after they had supped, after the meal of the Passover. So we have the first two cups, then comes the meal, the last morsel that is eaten during the Passover is the afikomen, the bread. And then comes the cup after supper, the third cup, which is the cup of redemption. Redemption. Looking back to the redemption God brought our forefathers from Egypt, yes, but also looking forward to that redemption when Messiah comes. And Jesus now, at the very highlight of this Passover celebration, having taken the bread, raises up the cup, after supper and declares, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And those words in the Hebrew would have sparked the disciples' minds back to the only place where that is mentioned in all of the Hebrew scriptures. Habrit ha new covenant. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they break, although I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. You see, that was the problem with the Mosaic covenant. It became a broken covenant. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and on their hearts I will write it. Mosaic covenant was written on tablets of stone. The new covenant was to be written on the tablet of our hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their sin and remember their iniquity no more. Oh, this was the ultimate condition upon which that new covenant rested when sin would be atoned for, not through daily offerings of animals in the temple, but once and for all. And Jesus now coming to the climax of this redemptive festival, taking the bread, raises the cup up and declares, that which has been promised, that which you've been waiting for, that new covenant has now come in my blood. Imagine how the disciples must have felt after having celebrated this Passover year after year after year and then one day in that upper room in Jerusalem seeing its very fulfillment. To imagine that God in delivering Israel from bondage and slavery in Egypt so long ago had in fact woven into the very fabric, painted the picture of the greatest redemption of all. And of that redemption you and I partake today if we know Christ as our Savior, if we have by faith applied the blood of His sacrifice to the doorpost of our hearts, Jesus is our Passover lamb. It is finished for you and for me through the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise His name. And you know what? The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. That's the fitting response of those of us who've experienced his redemption, who know what it means that the finished work of Christ has been realized in our hearts. We want to have a celebration. We want to give thanks and praise to God. And that's exactly how Passover concludes. We have a big say-so celebration, singing hymns from the Jewish National Hymnal. You all have copies, right? 
Well, of course you do, because the Psalms were Israel's hymnal, and Psalms 113 through 118 are sung at this time. In fact, the Gospels even record that Jesus and the disciples sang the hymn. And of course, this was a reference to the final hymn, the Great Hallel, and if you were to read it, you might want to imagine what it must have been like in that upper room for the Lamb of God, Jesus himself, singing these triumphant prophetic words. The stone which the builders rejected has now become the chief, and this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Praise the Lord. We sing the hymns of praise, and then we conclude with the cup of praise. The fourth cup is Hallel. You know, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Hallel, the cup of praise and the hymns of praise. And all over the world, Jewish people conclude the Passover by raising up the fourth cup and declaring, Lashana Haba Berushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. Because you see, Passover is not merely a commemoration of a redemption in the past, but it bears with it all the hope and promise of a redemption that my people are still waiting for. And therein lies the burden of my heart and that of Jews for Jesus. That my people would see what you've seen here today and understand this connection, the finished redemptive plan is in Jesus. Oh, it's not that my people are not still hoping and waiting. There's a tradition actually at Passover that Elijah the prophet may even visit us in fulfillment of the prophecy of Malachi who tells us that he is the forerunner and at a particular time the head of the house will say to the youngest child, go open the door for Elijah. See if he's there. And as the door is open, we stand to greet him and we say, Baruch haba b'ashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then we sing this ancient Hebrew melody. Eliyahu ha-navi, Eliyahu ha-tishbi, Eliyahu, Eliyahu, Eliyahu ha-giladi. Elijah the prophet Elijah the Tishbite, Elijah the Gileadite, come even in our days and bring with you Messiah, son of David. And every year my people stand and sing and wonder, is he ever going to come? They're still waiting. They don't know of that one named Yochanan. You know him as John, the baptizer, who coming in the spirit of Elijah, one day saw a Jewish men coming up over the hill and declared, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And of John, Jesus said, If you care to receive it, he is Elijah. And they don't know of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, who is that Lamb. My hope and prayer is that in our being together today, you might not only be enriched in your understanding of God's word and of this wonderful connection between Passover and the finished work of Christ in communion, but that you might in a greater way share this very burden with Jews for Jesus. For you see, together we are not like those of my people who do not know and so wait, but because we know him, we wait with great anticipation for the scriptures tell us, as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death until he come again. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I would like to pray now a blessing on you, an ancient Hebrew blessing from the book of Numbers chapter 6 that God gave to the priests of Israel, saying, bless my people with this blessing, and they will be blessed, first in Hebrew and then in English. Would you bow your heads, please? Yivarechecha Adonai v'yishmarecha Yoher Adonai panavalecha v'yikuneika Yisau Adonai panavalecha V'yoseim lecha 
Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Bashem Yeshua Meshichenu Sar HaShalom. In the name of Jesus, our Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Thank you. Wow. I, I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. What a powerful, powerful message of Christ in the Passover. I hope it's given you a better outlook on, on things like that. Well, here we are. Good Friday's just about over and Sunday's coming. Sunday's my favorite day, man. My absolute favorite day of the year because that's the day when Jesus rose, which completed the process of the greatness that He is for all that He's done for us. Hope you watch uh, live 1030 Easter Sunday morning. Get the kids up. Maybe you can hide a few eggs inside the house. Stay six feet apart, that kind of thing. You know how it is. Just believe in God's going to see us through all this stuff. But I also know no matter what virus is around or what anything's around, Christ is alive, and that makes me alive. Amen? Amen. Hope to see you Sunday.